Jason, I'm privileged to serve here as senior pastor. It's great to be with you this morning. Uh, today we're going to continue, or actually finalize, end our uh, sermon series we've been a part of over these last few weeks called Kingdom Politics, Following Jesus in a Partisan World. And so if you're new to us, if you haven't been joining us over the last few weeks, we are talking about politics in church, which, which can cause some anxiety in some people. Uh, but today, uh, what we want to do is kind of wrap it all up. Uh, and, and to do that, we asked for you uh, to submit some questions, some things that you would like uh, addressed, and, and, and then just even in conversations uh, that Pastor Todd and I have had with you in the hallways, via emails, phone calls uh, that we've had of, of really wrestling with our faith and politics and, and how do we make sense of it all, especially in this political climate where everybody just seems to be uh, butting heads and at each other's throats. So today we thought, uh, we've done this before where, where Todd and I would uh, kind of have dialogue with each other and, 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 and seek to address your, your questions. This is, we, we often find ourselves sitting in each other's office, uh, really wrestling with things and spurring off of each other and pushing each other and listening to uh, each other's wisdom and insight. And so what we want to do today is do that. And, and so we've kind of compiled some of these, the questions that you've answered. We can't obviously, and, and, and let me just say, I say the word answer as if we're smart enough to even do that. Uh, maybe the better way of saying it is to address your questions. Uh, you may not, we may not land on an answer on some of these, uh, some of these questions. We're going to make them worse. We're going to make them worse, yes, more than likely. Uh, we're going to make them uh, worse. So, so again, these are the questions some of you have asked and some of the things we've been wrestling with. And uh, this conversation doesn't end here. Uh, it doesn't end even after this election cycle. Because newsflash, there's going to be another election. Uh, it will just happen every time uh, around this year there seems to be an election. And funny how that happens. Uh, so even this, this conversation is something we're going to continue to have uh, as people of faith uh, as we engage our political system. So one of the questions that's come up um, is, uh, why vote at all? Uh, if we are citizens of heaven, which is what Paul says, what is the purpose of voting as, as a Christian? A nice easy one to start off. Yeah, with. that's right. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, we've been talking about for not just this series, but for years, we are, rightly so, because the gospel message is about the coming of the kingdom of God, right? That's what Jesus preaches over and over again. Uh, repent, realign with God's kingdom because it's here, it's coming, it's, it's, it's in your presence, it's fulfilled in me. So what does that mean, how we live in God's kingdom while at the same time we live in this world? And we've talked about how you can be a citizen of it's, it's not like a dual citizenship. We're citizen one for the other. Um, but that doesn't negate our, or take away our, our, uh, our need to be a part of this, this world and this country that we live in. There's, there's a guy I love. He used to be the president of Fuller Seminary. His name is Richard Mao. And, and Mao says this. I love this. He said, Jesus is a real ruler. It is not an honorific title. So as followers of Jesus, as Christians, as those who have, have said, Jesus, I, I want you to have me and I want to be in you, um, what does that mean? How do we follow this, this, this real ruler? Uh, what it doesn't mean is that we, we, we would draw and we, we, we get out of the, the day to day by kind of sort of waiting for, for something to happen. The Bible makes clear that we're supposed to engage and be a part of things. Um, where that comes across most uh, succinctly is in the, in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 29, the people of Israel have been exiled, and they've, they've gone into Babylon, and God is talking to his people through, through the prophet Jeremiah, and he says this. Uh, God says this. He says, um, he says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile mm -hmm. and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And then in the New Testament, Peter says the same thing. Live such good lives among the Gentiles that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day 
that he visits. So there is this call to engage, to seek the welfare of, of the nation without losing sight of our true home, of our true kingdom, which is the kingdom of God. So how do we behave accordingly in this place while never losing sight of the kingdom of God? Because Mao also says this beautiful thing. He says, absolute loyalty is something that only God deserves. So, so what, is that, what does that look like? This is other theologian, uh, has a great name, Reinhold Niebuhr. And Niebuhr talks about how, where is Christ when it comes to culture? Is Christ against culture? Uh, that there's this conflict between Christian values and the secular world and we should stay, keep things separate? Is it the Christ of culture? Um, where we find this common ground uh, and somehow integrate the two? Is it Christ above culture? Um, that Christ behi- provides the, the higher moral standard? Or is it in Christ the transformer of culture? Uh, that the transformative power of Christ transforms things and that we should be a part of that active transformation of culture, the same way Jesus was. And when I look at Jesus, especially look at uh, the Sermon on the Mount where we've been, it's the way Jesus transforms culture and engages with culture is constantly inviting people from the outside to the inside. Mm -hmm. He's constant with every healing he does, with every feeding he does, with everything he says. It's, I wanna widen this circle to make it bigger, the poor and powerless, the disenfranchised, uh, the beat up and bedraggled. How do we bring them in? This is our job. Mm -hmm. This is what Christ transforming culture Mm -hmm. looks like over and above everything else. Your thoughts. Uh, Well, I love that Jeremiah text too because of what Jeremiah says and that when we seek the welfare of the city, we also find Mm -hmm. welfare. Mm -hmm. And I think in our political system, we have, we have become so accustomed to winners and losers. That is how the system is set up. That is how the narrative is set up. And it's a winner-take-all type of thing. And I think a, a more faith-based approach to that is to say, okay, if I vote on something that I may not benefit, I may not see the initial benefit. It may benefit somebody else, the widening of the circle, especially when we think about the poor and the marginalized. I may vote for a policy or whatever that impacts them. That doesn't mean that I don't benefit from that. Mm -hmm. In reality, I do because Mm -hmm. culture and society benefits from that as well. So I like how Jeremiah frames that. For me, when I think of why vote at all, I always come back to this um, idea of stewardship, Mm -hmm. that everything we do is is an invitation for us to steward. And and we have to recognize that um, there are, like when we read scripture, like we looked at Romans 13 a couple of weeks ago where Paul's addressing government. Those Christians, those early Christians in Rome and throughout the region, had zero voice whatsoever. They had no ability to influence their government. Whatever their government said, they had to choose, do I get in line with that or face death or persecution? There are Christians today in many countries outside of this space who do not have the ability to to use, to steward even their voice because their voice and power is, is not... Uh, it just isn't isn't there. So for me, it's an invitation for me to think about how do I how do I use my voice uh, in a way that uplifts and empowers others. And I recognize too that um, I mean we are two white dudes sitting up here. Neither of us have ever not had the ability to vote. But there are people in this room who have not had the ability or historically have not had the ability to vote. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is an invitation to steward our privilege, to steward our, our power. But I think it is important um, that as we go to the ballot box, and we gave some like, uh, you can find it in your, your update, some prayers to pray as you go to the, the ballot box or get your absentee ballot, however you're gonna vote. Um, I think it's important to say, and you, and you mentioned this last week that I thought was so important. Um, as Christians, we are not called to save democracy or to save a country. Yes. We are called to be salt and light. 
That's it. Let me say that again. As Christians, we are not called, even though this is the narrative we hear, we are not called to save democracy itself or to save our country. Our role and posture as Christians is to consistently and constantly be salt and light, no matter who has power, no matter who runs the White House, no matter what the balance of Congress is. That doesn't change. So for those of, uh, uh, of you who are a little bit more on the right on, uh, politically, if, let's say, Vice President Harris gets elected and she ushers in this far-left liberal agenda, it still doesn't change your call to be salt and light. Right. And the same is true on the other side. Let's say uh, former President Trump gets elected and he ushers in a far-right authoritarian government it still doesn't change our call to be salt and light. So voting is more about, from my perspective, is more about just stewarding this privilege that we have to voice our opinion, to work toward a more equitable and just society, and to hold our leaders accountable in a way that many other, many other Christians um, don't have that ability to, to, to hold their leaders accountable. Yeah, yeah. We have a mutual friend, uh, Chris Heckman is a, is a pastor in yeah. our in our conference, and he posted something yesterday that he wrote I think is brilliant. I wanted to just share that. He says this, and I'll post this on our Facebook page, the things, this thing I know, if Jesus is Lord, we are under authority. Mm -hmm. Submission to him serves as the rule of our life. We can honor the authority of an institution, its conventions, its rules and praxis, an idea, ourselves, our own thoughts, what we think we deserve and ideal. Yet anything not submitted fully to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is a falsehood of our immense narcissism and enormous pride. Mm. Um, that's that's uh, going to the ballot box, humbly holding that privilege to steward yeah. uh, is, that's a beautiful image. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's good. Let me uh, ask you a nice, easy question. Um, what is a faithful approach to, you know, some nice, simple topics like, let's say, immigration and abortion? Oh, Jesus Christ, Mary, <laughs> Joseph, <laughs> come help me, all the, yeah. I was hoping I could just sit and you answer the question. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> let, let me say something about immigration first. I think the Beatitudes speak about this. Yep. This is the audience to whom Jesus is addressing, are the marginalized and the oppressed. And, and I think it's important for us, and what, what has been so hard this election cycle and, and I know what, what I'm about to say, you're going to make some assumptions about me. I can't control that. Make them about us. Oh, yeah, make them about us, yeah. Um, what has been so hard in this particular election cycle has been the, the, the rhetoric and the dehumanization of immigrants. Um, and I think that when, I mean, history has taught us throughout centuries of our nation and nations all around the world, when you dehumanize, when you take the humanity away from a group of people or a person, you then can justify any action toward them yes. because they become less than human. And I would say the rhetoric about immigrants in our country, whether they have come here legally or whether they have come here illegally, has been dehumanizing yes. and been a justification to say whatever we want to say about them. And so I think fundamentally as Christians, we always start with the, the, our original creation, which is to say all of us are made in the image of God. Yes. All of us are of sacred worth to God. And whether an immigrant comes here legally or whether they, they you know, have gone through the proper channels, whether they have crossed the southern border or whether they have overstayed their visa, they are still image bearers of God, of sacred worth, and therefore, as Christians, are of sacred worth to us. Mm -hmm. And so our rhetoric and our posture toward them should always be that they, are the, they bear the same image of God that I do. Um, 
And so when we start there, then we become far more sensitive Mm -hmm. to language and policies that dehumanize immigrants. Mm -hmm. And I'll also say that you cannot, as a person of faith, you cannot make a biblical Christian uh, argument for mass deportation. Uh, You can't. It it doesn't fit with Mm -hmm. Scripture. I've been meditating recently on Isaiah 56, and Isaiah 56 is a game changer of of Scripture in in the Old Testament. And Isaiah 56 talks about God is expanding this wideness, expanding uh, Israel's perspective, and and says, uh, he, he, he identifies two groups of people, God identifies two groups of people that have historically been on the margins and says, you are now a part of the family, and it's eunuchs and foreigners. And if you know anything about Israel's history, they're an isolationist culture. Uh, It was about them. They are God's people. And God says in Isaiah 56, but now you foreigners will be on my holy mountain, Mm -hmm. and I will give you names. I will give you a privilege, and I will give you uh, uh, an identity. So you cannot make a case for mass deportation. And I know that that pits, that that makes us seem like we're uh, aligning with one political party of the other. But you just, I just don't think you can. So I think then when we have conversations about immigration, it's important. Immigration is really important. And I, and I think we should have uh, laws and policies and ways in which people can enter our country legally. I, I think that that makes sense for a nation. They need those, the, they need those laws. Um, but I think a, a faith-based approach should always be how do we honor the humanity of the person Yep. And, and our approach should be one of justice and equity and compassion. If, if we're going to take a faith-based approach to immigration, then we should advocate for policies and laws that are just, equitable, and compassionate. Um, I don't think we can, we can come at any other angle yep. than, than that. And, and as followers of Jesus who have been welcomed, yeah. how are we welcoming and that, I'm scared of the answer of that for me. Mm-hmm. What does that mean, not just for Scioto Ridge and our, our facility, what does that mean for me in my home? Mm-hmm. What does that mean for uh, me and just who I'm comfortable with, who I'm with? I mean, that expands that, that circle and puts the responsibility on us to be exactly what you said. That's how we're salt and light. Yeah, not good. absolutely, That's yep, absolutely. So abortion. <laughs> Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So let me say this: um, I, I, I am, I'm pro-life, uh, and that, that for me, that's all. That's expensive. I hate those labels. First of all, I just hate labels. Pro-life, pro- I just don't think labels are helpful. But I'm pro-life in the sense of like I don't, I don't believe in the death penalty for any reason. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in war. Uh, I can't justify war. Um, and so I take kind of a, a, a full pro-life ethic. Um, and I'll say, like, this has for me been a singular topic that often I would go to the ballot box with this in mind um, and had been raised to make this a sing- singular issue. And it had been for years. But as a pastor, we have the unique uh, uh, role, vocation, that we're often invited into really hard, intimate conversations with people. And, and so, as a pastor, I have sat with women who have been raped and have found themselves pregnant. I've sat with women who, based off their uh, family situation, uh, found themselves pregnant and are, it's not the best environment for them. I've sat with women who are in dire economic situations uh, and, and find themselves pregnant. And they've come and they've asked, Pastor, what do I, what do, I do? And so for me, those conversations uh, really began to change my perspective to say what I used to believe was very black and white uh, is, is far more gray than, than I think I ever had seen it before. Uh, and so, and I recognize too, again, we are two white guys talking about this, two white men talking about this, and so uh, this is, it's, it's, it's a weird conversation to have, but yet there are people who are in situations that I never have found myself in, 
And so it's, it's, it's helped me kind of have more of a pastoral approach and a pastoral response. And, and because these are complex issues, and for me, not as black and white as they, they, they used to be, um, I'm really appreciative of our denominational stance on this. So as a denomination, we're a United Methodist denomination, which means we, we have a whole global body that is helping shape our kind of positions, our theological statements on things. And we have a theological uh, statements called social, our social principles, which address a myriad of things from, from abortion to war to uh, wage disparities to farmers' rights. I mean, it's just kind of all these social issues. Um, and in, in, in our social principles, uh, w- I think they take a very balanced approach, and one of the statements in our social principles around abortion is this. Our commitment to the sanctity of life makes us reluctant to Mm -hmm. condone abortion, Mm -hmm. Uh, makes us reluctant to condone it. But then it goes on to say, um, but if it happens, here are some here are some boundaries that we think are a faithful response. And here's just a couple. Rejecting it as a means of acceptable birth control or a mechanic for gender selection or eugenics, um, supporting requirements for parents of minors to be notified, except uh, in the case of alleged uh, uh, incest. It rejects late-term abortions, except when the mother's life is at risk or a fetal abnormality uh, is, is now not conducive for life. And so I actually find that to be a really helpful a statement because it, it's recognizing the complexity of life uh, and recognizing like it, it's hard to condone it but to say life happens and so women ought to be able to have a choice on how they navigate those conversations and situations just like the women who have I've been privileged to, to sit with and so I think it's important that when we take something away from somebody when we take a right away from that person what we're also taking away is their ability to discern. And that, Mm -hmm. to me, the faith journey is a constant journey of discernment. We are always in a posture of discerning, asking the Spirit of God to give us wisdom as we make decisions. And so when that is taken away from one particular group of people, women, they no longer have that ability to discern and make choices uh, that they believe are right for themselves uh, or for, for their family. I mean, all that fits what you said earlier, too, about humanizing and dehumanizing. Uh, The more black and white, this is an easy yes and easy no, things come, it, that does, that's, that's one way we dehumanize folks, instead of realizing and recognizing the complexity of life and the mystery of life and making room for that, especially when we talk with folks we don't agree with, which is the next question. There's 29 days till election day. More importantly, there are 53 days to get ready until Thanksgiving when you have to sit down (laughs) with your crazy uncle. (laughs) How do we talk with our neighbor, with our relatives whom we viscerally disagree with and vehemently disagree with? uh, What do we do? Yeah. This, I think, is the hardest, uh, this, is the, this is the question we've heard, actually, uh, quite regularly from people, is how, how, do I, how do I engage with the person that I just vehemently disagree? And maybe what, you know, we just commented on immigration abortion, you may be one of those people who would disagree with us. So how do we move forward as siblings in Christ when we may have a fundamental disagreement on a policy like immigration, abortion, or whatever uh, other policies on the books? Um, how do you show up at Thanksgiving? and still love the parent, the grandparent, the niece, the nephew, the cousin, the child that may vehemently disagree with you politically and you disagree with them. Uh, How do you pull into your neighborhood when the neighbor across the street or next to you has a political sign uh, that you just absolutely disagree with? Several. Several (laughs) political signs that you just disagree with. How how do you still show them love? And, And so, you know, this whole series has been revolved around the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says it in other places in the gospel. Uh, You know, Matthew, in Matthew 5, he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
pray for those who persecute you. You've heard it said, but now I say to you, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. And, And as good suburbanites, I doubt any of us would use the language, or maybe you would, but I, I, I wouldn't use the language of saying, my, that person with that other political sign is my enemy, or my family member who votes differently is my enemy. But if we're honest, that's what our thoughts indicate. Because we think, how can they be a Christian, especially mm-hmm. in siblings in Christ, mm-hmm. how can they be a Christian mm-hmm. and vote for that person? How can they be a Christian and do that? How can they be a citizen of the same nation as I am mm-hmm. and vote for that person? So our, our thoughts are enemy thoughts, and we categorize them as such. And it goes back to the dehumanization. We, we are just, it's just as easy for people of us to do the same thing, to dehumanize an, another person. Um, so we have to wrestle with that. And Jesus just says, like, he doesn't tell us how to do it. <laughs> he just says, do it. Love your enemy. Pray for them. Mm-hmm. I love um, Proverbs 25, and it's repeated. Paul repeats it in Romans 12, and we looked at it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Proverbs 25 says this, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. And growing up, I always heard, I believed that phrase, heaping burning coals on somebody's head, was meant to shame them. Like, you do good to them to make them feel bad about themselves. And that's not what that passage means at all. Uh, what it means is uh, you literally would carry coals and baskets on top of your head. And so if somebody came to you and their fire was out and they needed some coals, it, you can just put a couple of coals in their head. If your enemy shows up to you and is asking for, they're, they're cold and they're asking for some coals, you could put a couple in there. But to heap burning coals on their head is to overflow with generosity toward them, to fill their basket full mm. of coals. Mm. And Jesus, or uh, Paul repeats this in Romans 12. Jesus echoes this throughout the Sermon on the Mount and the Gospels, that this is the posture of a Christian, is even when we disagree with somebody, we love them, and we go out of our way to show them generosity, which I want to use a different word. It really stinks, but that's not the word I want to use. It's hard to do this Mm -hmm. when you feel so strongly that the other person doesn't get it. But the posture, for me, it's always about posture. The posture of a Christian is to be Mm -hmm. Mm open-handed with everything that we have, everything we do, including our words. I have concerns. We're not, we're not politically, uh, you know, naive like we have concerns about certain policies if they're enacted we have we have people you're going to vote for somebody i'm going to vote for somebody i have concerns if the other person doesn't get elected but it doesn't change my posture toward the other the other person or the 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 other political party and john wesley again the founder of our tradition methodist tradition wrestled with the same question and in 1774 in in a journal entry uh he wrote this He said, I met with those of our society who had votes in the ensuing election and advised them. This is the guidance he gave. He said, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy, which is a discernment question. To spend, that's what we've been talking about these last uh, several weeks, discern who you're going to vote for. Um, And then he says this, to speak no evil of the person they voted against. (laughs) That one's hard. And number three, to take care of their spirits that they were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. Mm. So the emphasis is on us Mm -hmm. and our posture and our our heart, not trying to change the mind of the other person or shaming them or dehumanizing them, but this consistent call to be humble. Yeah. That's good. There's a little QR code in the corner of, of this slide and the ones that are coming next. If you want to kind of keep that to chew on for yourself, you just click on that or take a picture of the thing. I don't care. You, you do you. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is uh, there's, um, there's a guy we both really like. His name's Brad Jersick. And, and Jersick uh, posted something recently I thought was brilliant. It, it was how to hold difference with respect so how do you this is a practical way to do that to not dehumanize and hold 
and actually have conversations with, with your crazy uncle. <laughs> um, if, and if you don't have a crazy uncle, you're the crazy uncle. Just yes. <laughs> know that. That's right. Uh, just first is uh, getting past the rhetoric, the political rhetoric, is ask them to, invite, to share their story. Uh, what is their story? Um, make space to hear their hopes and fears. Um, if you're talking about politics, maybe what is, get, that's a deeper question. What is your hope for this? What, is, what are your fears around this? It, validate feelings. Connect with their feelings. You know what it means to be afraid. You know what it means to be angry. Uh, validate the importance of that feelings and then ask permission to share your own experience can I sh can I share my story with you uh, assume the best of the other that they're being faithful to a conviction that's important to them uh, ask them for three words that describe a healthy relationship uh, to affirm your common core values um, when they say something you, dis they dis you disagree with, uh, a great question to ask yourself, in what ways is this true? Mm -hmm. This thing I disagree with, what is the truth in it? Uh, this number seven, I added this one, so this is mine, practice the pause. Mm -hmm. If you're like ready to throw down with whoever, it's okay to pause, take a deep breath. Um, what is this bringing up in me? What is the story I'm telling myself about them, about their choices, about me? And then enjoy the freedom of diverse perspectives. And if you're out eating with them, out to dinner, you cover the bill and leave a big honking tip, mm. um, literally and metaphorically. Uh, those are those are jurisdicts where rules which I think are brilliant for how we connect. Yeah And so here's what's crazy about our faith Politics matter we believe they matter they influence people's lives But they're not the end-all be-all of life the kingdom of God is yes. and here's what's so crazy about the way Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God the way his ministry uh, revealed the kingdom of God and the invitation for us to partner with Jesus in revealing the kingdom of God is who's actually there. And one of the, we're gonna take communion, one of the great metaphors or images of the communion table is a banquet, a feast. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the radical thing of God is that we are invited to come feast at this banquet and we will be blown away at who also is at the table. Yeah. Yeah. And so I fully anticipate that when I'm invited to the feast, the table, I'm going to show up, and Jesus is going to say to me, hey, we've saved a seat for you. Look who's your partner on your left and your partner on the right. Look who's sitting next to you. Trump and Vance have come, and Harris and Waltz have come as well, mm -hmm. and are feasting at the same meal together. That's, that's what Jesus invites us yep. into. Yep. Immigrants, uh, trans people, yeah. billionaires and oligarchs, hookers and bums. No. We're all going to be there together yeah. celebrating at this beautiful table. And so that's what this, this, this table means. It's a leveling table. Mm. It levels all of us. And it's this, this cosmic invitation of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus to say, come all, mm. come all and feast at this table, no matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you're an independent, whether you're going to vote or not going to vote, come to this table and feast and taste and see that I am good. And so again, all this matters. Like politically, we should wrestle with these things, but this and the meaning behind this table matters far more. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we taste this and receive this and recognize what Christ has done for us, mm -hmm. then we would be willing to show love and grace to anybody because Christ knows every sin I've committed everything I have done wrong in word and deed, and yet says, you know what? I, I, got, I got a space for you. Yeah. I've been waiting for you to come and feast. Um, so we remember on the night in which Jesus gathered with his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, 
which is given for you. And sitting at that table were zealots and tax collectors and fishermen. They could not be any more different. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says this, this body, it's for you. At the same meal, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave thanks and said, this cup represents the blood of a whole new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink of this cup, remember me. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will be poured out upon all of us gathered here and on this gift of bread and cup. Make it be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we, your people, in our diverse perspectives, in our diverse ideologies, that we would come freely to feast and see and taste that you are good. May this give nourish the depths of our spirit. May it renew your image within each of us that we might better and more effectively reflect your goodness and grace back out into the world. And so we come just as we are, we come to receive this holy gift. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.